we are we welcome uh, Praveer Prakasta, who is uh, who is the editor of News Click, uh, the office which is located in New Delhi, and uh, which uh, which is an online news portal uh, which covers uh, the all the different aspects of news related to workers and the alternatives. Uh, He's uh, going to speak today on the exponential growth of the pandemic and what is COVID-19. Uh, it's a very serious disease. Uh, we all are aware about it now. Uh, let's start with the meeting. Uh, the meeting will be, uh, I would also request the speaker, Praveer, to speak for 20, 25 minutes and then take up the questions, uh, which I think is very important. I think a lot of people will be uh, are really interested in asking a lot of questions. So that's a request to you, Praveer. Okay, I'll start then. So, okay. Yeah. So, basically, what we are talking about is that what I, what Atul already said, what is the epidemiology of COVID 19? And uh, what is the epidemic like? What are certain basic features now we know? I'm not going to get into uh, the medical or the biological details too much because that's really not my area of knowledge but we'll talk about how the numbers have grown and then what is it that china did in wuhan and therefore what are the lessons for all of us then i'll do a quick update on what the essential uh, medical issues are that we are seeing and what are the kind of medicines that may work what are being tested and then looking also at the vaccine scene the vaccine is more a long-term solution in the sense 12 months or so. And then finally, the question answer. So this is the three parts to the uh, presentation. So let's look at first the epidemiology of the disease itself. Now, if we look at Wuhan, and this is the picture that we had in Wuhan, then we will see that Wuhan in the for the month of December, when it really takes place, these are really small numbers that are there at that point. There are about probably something like 50 to 100 numbers that were there in Wuhan. We don't know what is the zeroth case, what is the first case, that's still a mystery. But that time it is not clear that this was a new disease because what you are seeing is essentially flu-like symptoms, a drier cough, but essentially something which appears to be like flu, as the SARS virus also was, but it also leads to pneumonia. So you started looking at certain, what would be called atypical pneumonias, pneumonias which are not very usual. And when, you, when the Wuhan authorities, the medical authorities got this in a family, and then started seeing this amongst other cases also. Then by end of December, by the, by the time there were only about 100 cases, that they notified the, uh, the disease control authority in the Hubei province, as well as the central authorities, that there is a possibility we have a new virus which is infecting the people. Now here again, uh, if you look at the two other coronaviruses which have had major effect, one is the SARS coronavirus, what we now call SARS-CoV-1. That virus was something which had jumped from possibly the bats via some intermediate uh, link maybe, and that had infected the, the infected people. But the infection rate or the transmission rate was either not that high or people reacted very quickly. Whatever it is, it didn't spread too far. The MERS virus, which is also something similar, which comes from camels, the human to human transmission was very low. So what happens in this kind of cases that what they did not really understand medically, that you were looking at human to human transmissions, which are quite rapid. Now, this was something which distinguished the SARS earlier virus, as well as the MERS virus, from what is now being called the SARS-CoV-2. This is something which, if you see later, the growth of the virus is still very, very slow, as it appears. But that's because when you have an epidemic, the rate at which it starts to uh, develop 
appears to be small in number, but you are already starting to see what is called exponential growth. That means the numbers double every few days. We'll come back to the exponential growth issue a little later. But this is the blue bars that you see, the blue, blue column bars that you see are what is now known as the actual growth of the disease. But you didn't know that the growth was of this order because the tests had yet to be developed. Chinese were able to do, the Chinese doctors, medical researchers were able to genome sequence the virus within about a week or 10 days. They developed the test kit for the virus within about two to two weeks to 20 days. And they had started stress testing in Wuhan in about 20 days using the test kits which they had developed. Now the test kits need the genome sequence and the entire genome sequence the Chinese had put on the global database is the origin of the test kits developed everywhere. Now, of course, later on, people also have now the virus genome in their own countries. But at that point of time, they did not. So the Chinese identified the genome. They also distributed the genome sequence in a global database. And they also developed the test kits themselves, which they started testing in Wuhan. And from 23rd onwards, 23rd, 24th, they realized that the issue was really something which was quite serious and they declared a complete lockdown. Now, when the lockdown is declared, you can see the blue bars start decreasing quite fast. But because the test rates are testing is being done more and more, they're being done more widely, you can see immediately that you have the test identified cases go up while the actual cases are going on. So this takes a little more time but by the time the test cases have started to go down, you will already see that the blue bars are going down quite a bit. And as we know, the Chinese were able to contain the virus within about six weeks or so. The numbers started falling. And as you know, China figures now are pretty, pretty good. Now, if we talk about the epidemic, the, the nature of the disease, of course, lots of papers have come out. <clears throat> I'll share the presentation with all the people who are here. And they, you will see the references also given about the, what, these, uh, what these papers are from which I'm drawing the data. So coming back to what I talked about earlier, what is the disease growth that takes place? Now, if we see today, and I have not put China in the list because China numbers are very small at the moment. So I'm really looking only at the figures which are there now on your, uh, on the countries, which are Italy, US, Spain, Spain, Germany, Iran, and then we have also Malaysia and also India. Now, if we look at all these countries and the key ones which have been identified are US, India, and Italy. Now, if you see them, the country that starts off rather rapidly is Italy. Now, this chart is not based on a calendar. It's based on when does all countries reach the number 100. So 100 is treated as the zero date in this sense, from which this chart develops each country's numbers, plots each country's numbers. It's called a semi-log plot because the y-axis is a log, so you see it, the numbers go up and it doesn't explode on your graph. So we can see that numbers a little better. And uh, it also lets you draw this uh, trend lines a little more easily. And the days are at the bottom of your chart. Now this gives us a sense of how quickly the disease is actually growing in each of the countries. And if you see the top line, that shows the doubling every two days. Now, for a lot of countries, what you see is doubling two, every two days is really not doubling of the disease per se, because we are also testing extensively now at a certain point. Then the numbers seem to explode even more that the disease actually is growing. So the first phase, when this, what you see as a very rapid doubling rate, is really both the infection going up as well as your testing capturing more and more of the people who are infected, 
earlier you didn't notice them because you didn't test enough. So low rates, for instance, in India at the moment can simply be because we are not testing enough. And when we do test it up, suddenly it may explode even faster than it actually in reality would. So you can see that <clears throat> Italy in this group was the first to go up very rapidly, followed by Spain, France, Germany, and now uh, Iran also, and now also the US. So you have a number of them which go up and in this speed at which it is going up, you can see that they're doubling currently at the rate of three to four days. Now, India and Malaysia, which I've also plotted here, as basically the argument being some of the tropical countries are slowing, showing a slower rate of growth, that looking at these figures, the slow growth is mainly because the numbers are still small. So even if it doubles every four days, you're not seeing the rapid growth of numbers, though in terms of rate, it is still almost the same as other countries. So we don't see a very significant difference of the growth rate of the uh, South Asian, Southeast Asian countries, what is called the tropical, moderate tropical uh, climate, where there was an expectation that maybe the rates will be lower. So what it also seems to show that temperature and humidity may not play as much of a role as people think it might. So if we have hopes that because we are a hot country or a humid country, that the epidemic will not spread at the same rate, maybe it may be true, but only in a very small way. And if it doubles, all that it means is doubling every five days still means the end numbers do not look very different. Now, I'm going to deal with a little more of this doubling issue because that is something very difficult to understand for most people because there is something called the cognitive gap that we generally tend to extrapolate linearly. We generally tend to add numbers. We don't multiply them and therefore we, we do not understand what the exponential growth really is. Now, if we have one million today, very simply, that if you double every four days, you are going to see a billion in about 30, 32 days. That's a simple doubling. Now, that's not a big issue. Same. So it's a month, we get a mid billion. But the next day, you will get 2 billion. The next day, you get 4 billion. And, and the next day, you will get 8 billion, which is more than the number of people in the world. So about 36, 37 days, if we just double, of course, that's not what the disease will really do then you will see a huge increase over the next 35, 50 days. <clears throat> of course, with strong mitigation measures, essentially lockdowns of different kinds, and also checking your contacts, checking the people, like what was done in Wuhan, separating the infected, we'll come to all of that. You may, of course, get a handle on the numbers. It may go up much more slowly. Now, there is this Boris Johnson theory of herd immunity. Let's understand, herd immunity would mean that almost 60% to 70% of the people of the world would have to get infected. That means we are looking at something like four to five billion infected people, and we are looking at a case fatality ratio, even if it is only 1%, because maybe much higher as we are now seeing in Italy and the United States, we are looking at something like 40 to 50 billion people <coughs> dying. So that is, a, this is not an option that the globe can take. So the real issue is, what do we do? And I'll come back to this issue, just two small pointers here. Apart from the kind of mitigation measures, which are strong measures to see that you do social distances, uh, social distancing, identify people and separate the infected, all of that. If you do, then you can at least flatten the curve considerably. If you do it as effectively as the Chinese have done, you can even get a handle on the disease. So that is a challenge that all of us are going to face in different degrees, in different countries, in different ways. So we'll come back to this issue later. As I've said here, if you're looking at global percentages, India is one seventh of the population. So 
this is going to be of course a very large number in india uh, as well plus because the, the poorer countries have much poorer infrastructure so the health disaster in terms of hospitals hospital beds intensive care may be much lower and therefore we may see a much bigger problem in the poorer countries of which india was also one of them now i think we are we, i have concluded here by saying that of course we are all looking at a major global catastrophe now if we look at particularly indian scenario and i'm uh, this unfortunately forgot to uh, label this curve so this if you could see the countries below then it gives you indonesia it gives pakistan it gives malaysia it gives uh, thailand and of course my test case is malaysia so if we look at this malaysia is about 13 days behind italy and if you take this particular graph it shows that we are about 7 days behind malaysia so the dis the difference between india for example and italy the zero date case that i took for the 100 cases to be synchronized at one point then we are about 20 days away from when italy really took off we have 2000 now that we are seeing in india as per the latest government figures 2000 is a cumulative figure that is not total active number active number is about 1800 or so because some people have recovered some people have died and we are looking at 50 deaths already so this numbers would seem to show that we are about 10 to 15 days away from seeing very very significant numbers in india as well now what we do with the lockdown how much the lockdown has been effective is an open question because already we can see hot spots in places like dharabi in mumbai as you know social distancing physical distancing etc meaningless in the kind of crowded uh, localities that is dharabi and various other uh, places in the country so those kind of urban densely populated clusters this will really have much less effect and therefore there is a possibility that these hot spots now will lead to what is called community transmission and once you are in the stage of community transmission then you are really we would start looking like what italy france uh, uh, iran and united states is in so things at the moment don't look good and particularly because our testing figures in india are extremely low we are doing something like 6000 tests per day at the moment we probably need to do something of the order of 50 to 60000 tests and we don't have the capacity right now of doing more than 15000 tests a day so unless we are able to really change our testing capacities by an order of magnitude we are going to be completely behind the curve and i think that is the critical challenge india is facing right now that icmr icmr's uh, recommendation on testing are extremely conservative and that means a huge number of people who might be having covid-19 cannot get themselves tested with icmr's current guidelines so this is the challenge india faces and i'm not sure that most countries face similar challenges some do lot of them don't for instance if you take a country like south korea or you take a country like vietnam their testing figures are much higher than india and we are looking at people tested per million in that india is really one of the lowest in the world so those are the kind of challenges we face and as i said with 2000 people affected infected with 50 people dead you are you need tests which are much much higher order than what we are doing at the moment i do not know the status of the test kits the icmr is being very cagey about it i do know we do not know what the constraints of testing are but we do know that what the hospitals are seeing what the state governments are asking and what icmr is able to do is not really meeting even one third to one tenth of the demand that is there on the system so i let it go at that i come back to exponential growth now exponential growth i have said is something difficult for people to understand 
I'll give a couple of examples and leave this for you to play with. The why, for instance, if a number doubles every day, what happens? Now, this is a famous story, which is whoever discovered the chess as a game went to the king and said, I've discovered this fantastic game. It will help your soldiers, your generals to understand strategy. So this is really a war gaming of a very high quality. And this is that he explained the game to the king, showed him how it is played. The king was very impressed. He said, OK, what is the gift you need? I want to give you a handsome gift. He said, I don't need much. You know, I'm just a simple guy. I need one grain of wheat on the first square. And the second square, you double that on the and double it every successive square. So now the question was, King said, that's it. That's a very small request. So I made a spelling mistake. It's not what we'll require. How much of wheat will be required? So that was the question. So the king said, bring two, you know, one, three sackfuls. That should be enough. So then they started putting it. And this found this very quickly ran out of wheat. So calculation is here for you to check, cross check, that it would mean two. 50 trillion tons of wheat. Now, 250 trillion tons of wheat is much more than the global production, many times more than the global production. So that is a simple exponential increase doubling every square. Now, there are nice videos on the, uh, on the net for this. I've given a, a national public uh, televisions one video over here, which you can see that actually is connected this exponential growth issue to that of the COVID-19 case. Now, this is a paper because I want, to share, I want to share with you what is it that was done in Wuhan, how much was really uh, known, what is known by the people and what really happened. Because most people take it as if what they did in Wuhan was an extremely authoritarian step that locked down everybody, and it has imposed a huge amount of problems for the people. And it's by this coercive measure, China was able to control. This is not what the democratic societies can do. Now, if we look at what happened in Wuhan, again, I've given the reference to the paper. Then this is the key points that I, what I'm going to tell you. Again, as I said, these are not my uh, conclusions. The conclusions which are available uh, from the paper. And this is a presentation which is there in Harvard's uh, website. There is uh, what's called the Harvard Public Health Center. So there, there is a, uh, they have a website where the present, a much more detailed presentation is available. So this slide shows that in the first phase, which we were talking about January 1 to about January 23rd, the, what is called the R, the effective reproduction number. Now, this effective reproduction number is, a math, is a, basically a number which says how many people does one person infect in the period of the disease. Now, the, without getting into details, at each period of the disease, depending on the measures you take, the number you infect are different. And of course, it also depends on the people have been vaccinated or there is, they're already infected. So they have what is called infected and recovered. So they have what is called herd immunity. So or they have immunity. So given that the effective reproductive numbers will differ. In the first phase, before the lockdown, their estimate was it was 3.88. Now the 3.88 is, of course, of the figures that they identified. Now, today, we are aware of the fact that there is a very large number of people who were not identified during this period itself, that they remain unidentified, and therefore, they were not tested and found to have been infected. But we are looking at the, the, what is called the tested and identified to be uh, infected numbers. So they saw the numbers in this period was something like 3.88. When the lockdown was done, then also the numbers were 1.25. That means one person was infecting more than one person. That means though the rate of infections was slower, the numbers would have still gone up. Remember, if there are more than one, 
then the infection, then the epidemic does not come down, epidemic numbers will still go up. So this is what would happen if it is 1.25. This was the first phase, but the numbers were really growing up, growing up exponentially. The second phase still is showing exponential growth, but a much lower rate of growth. This is the blue, as you can see, if they had not taken any control in this period, it would still have grown exponentially, though it had grown at a smaller rate. Then what they did, and this is what brings down the numbers, this R0.32, this is what they do at this point. And you can see the line falling. This number start to fall because they do what is called really a centralized quarantine. The centralized quarantine is what they do after February 1st. This is the February 2nd onwards. They do what is called centralized quarantine. And the centralized quarantine, what they essentially do is that if you first have fever clinics, fever clinics, you go not to hospital where you can also get infected if you're not infected yourself or infect others. So what you go is to a fever clinic and you give your sample and you wait. And once the sample is tested within a certain number of hours, maybe half an hour, one hour, two hours, then if you have tested positive, you go to a mobile hospital. Otherwise, you go to a quarantine place where you would be, otherwise you go home. If you are really somebody who is also in contact with somebody who's been infected, then you go to a central quarantine place and then you are you wait there till you are tested and you found to be you have a symptoms and you're found to be positive now here also those who could be suspected could come and they would go to the fever clinics or they would be after testing positive would be again taken to mobile hospitals the mobile hospitals were really converted from gymnasiums stadiums other places and then if they were only seriously ill they were, of course they are attended to then they would be transferred to regular hospitals with ICUs. So this ability to separate people, from those who are suspected and those who are infected, into separate groups and treat them separately from those who are not infected, that was one of the key elements of centralized quarantine. The other part of it is people who are also those who are attending to hospitals were separated into hotels or other nearby structures where they could go, come back and go to the hospitals more easily. They were given food, they were looked after, but they also were not in touch with the families because they could otherwise carry the infection back to their families. So the idea was that if you do not separate those who are infected from even other family members, you are going to infect the family, numbers will only go up. So therefore, the separation of those who are infected was something which was central to bringing down the rate from 1.25, as we saw, to less than 1. And once it came to 0.38, the epidemic very quickly petered out from Wuhan. So this is, I give, give come back to my slide, how the epidemic really was controlled. So a lot of the things that people talk about on the, under the what China did is a misunderstanding of what China really did. As Dr. Aylward, who is the WHO, he said, when the Italians rang him up and said that, you know, we have put down the same lockdown as China did. He said, well, you have done the hard part. Now comes the really hard part, where you have to separate those who are infected from those who are not. Because if you don't do that, then your numbers will not go, go down. Now, <clears throat> I'll leave with the last point that in the first phase of the disease, there was a lot of the people who were in the hospitals who were infected. In fact, 3,000 medical personnel who were in Wuhan got infected and got COVID-19. But once they understood that actually this is not something that can be handled without full body protective gear, it can infect from the hair, it can infect from your eyes. Of course, we know the, the nose and we know the throat, but all of the other points are also infect, points of infection. All of this, if you need to protect yourself against, particularly for medical staff and you are in 
touch with the patients all the time, then you need to be fully, you should be fully covered with protective gear, your gloves, N95 respirator masks, your, then, uh, then you have your goggles and you have your full body protective gear. All of this is what you require if you want to handle COVID-19 patients. The important part is once they understood and they had ratcheted up the supply of protective gear, the next 42,000 doctors and other medical personnel who came to Wuhan from outside uh, Hubei province, none of them were, none of them fell ill. That means the protective gear really worked and the protocols they had established really worked. Now that is something which we did not see in Italy. In fact, the Italian doctors now say it was the hospitals that got infected. It was the inability to control the infection in the hospitals that led to the explosion that we saw because hospitals acted as a really as the, a, a further hot spot for spreading the epidemic. We are now seeing the collapse of the hospitals in the United States. In the numbers of patients increase, you do not have respiratory support. Then you have to do what is called triage, which is what the Italian doctors have started doing for the last three weeks. You say if you're above 65 to 70, you have little chance of surviving. So let's give the respirator to somebody who can actually survive. So respirators, ventilators, oxygen support, all of this go to people who can survive and those whose chances of survival are low, well, they can take their, uh, they can try their luck and most of them do not survive. So what you see is people above 80 have poor survivability, uh, particularly under such conditions. And you can see the numbers of number of deaths which are high, starting with Italy, and then you have seen the numbers of deaths which are high now in the United States. I think they had more than 800 people dying just yesterday. So this is an indication of the collapse of the health system when after a certain point, you do not have the kind of uh, intensive care support the respiratory patients require, which means ventilators, I will not go into ECMOs, which are even more, more difficult to con consider at the moment. And even oxygen support is not available after a certain point. So this is the, these are the conditions that if you keep what is called flattening the curve, if you can postpone the crisis, even by a few months, what you do is flatten the curve. If you flatten the curve, the pressure of the hospitals are not so high. And if that happens, you will be, you think that at least most of the patients will recover. The death rates will be lower. You can see the death rates between Germany and Italy. And it does seem that some of the issues that the Italians face, Germans have handled it better because their hospitals have been able to cope with this, the intensive care requirements of the older patients better than the Italians. Of course, Italians have what is called the Mediterranean diet. They have the most number of old people, not the most number, I think they're fourth highest in the world in terms of oldest population. They have a much older population than most countries. India has comparatively a younger population. So our death rates may be much lower than Italy's, but nevertheless, old people like me are of course, if it comes to triage, are going to be left to fend for themselves. So we may not even need to go to a hospital. <laughs> so coming <coughs> to the question, two other questions I said I would treat. That the really, if we model this epide epidemic in what is called the simple modeling uh, experiment, then what we are doing by what are called strong mitigation measures of which of course lockdown is a key one, is that you then, hope to flatten the curve. And if you flatten the curve, then the peak is either postponed or it becomes flatter. Your hospital system then can take care of the load. In countries like India, where the intensive care beds are few, hospital beds are also few, this may not do very well, unless we are able to build spare capacity very quickly. For that, we need to have supply chain. We need to have protective gear. Whether it's India, whether it's Italy, whether it's the United States, the, what we are hearing is the same. Not enough 
protective gear. This is the key problem that is there. The more time we have, the more time at least the hospital staff can be. Just I think I saw some report today itself. Seven doctors treating COVID patients have fallen ill, which means even your health system, which is supposed to take care of the patients, can themselves be taken out if we do not provide protective gear to them. So that's one part of it, that how do you handle the supply chain you require just simply for medical gear and medicines. So that's one part of the problem. The second part of the problem, of course, is what I would call a self-goal by the Indian administration, which without any preparation introduced a lockdown. It meant that the poor people who have no reserves, no economic reserves, they were either left to starve or try and get back to the villages. The lockdown therefore really broke down in lots of places and we saw large migrations. Such migrations then would distribute the infection all over the country. Therefore, the purpose of the lockdown was defeated by not planning for the obvious consequence, which is people would like to go back home because they have no resources to continue under lockdown. And of course, this is exactly what happened. And if you see what the prime minister's response was, even after all of this, he had basically not much to say what the state would do or what his administration would do. He basically said people should not cross the Lakshman Rekha, they should stay in their houses, but how they would get food, what would be done by the state, by the government, that was something which was left up, left up in the air. And since the state governments have a bulk of the responsibility here, it was indicative of the kind of distance that the central government has under Modi, that the chief ministers were not even aware that a lockdown of this nature was going to be imposed on the entire country on the day that it was imposed. And only after it was imposed, even departments of food and civil supplies were not recognized as essential services, only post facto, after the lockdown and the initial list, civil supplies, food and civil supplies was added. I'm not going to get into the details of this, take only to say if the purpose of lockdown was physical distancing, one aspect of it broke down because of the migration we have seen in the first seven days. Can it now be controlled? Let us see. But leaving that out, yes, the strong mitigation measures in some sense have failed, but at least for maybe 80 to 85 percent of the population still continues. Therefore, it is possible that at least the speed at which the infections are developing will slow down. But the slowdown is going to take two weeks because those who have been infected in the last 7, 10, 15 days, they're going to show up as COVID patients in the next week or so. So I think that we are still very much on the edge. Whether we will be 10 days behind, we'll be 15 days behind, we'll be 30 days behind what has happened in Italy or in the US, we have to see. Will you be able to control it? At the moment, unless we really scale up our testing, I don't see that happening. So crucial issue is testing, separation, centralized quarantine of some kind. These are the measures we have to look at. And what uh, the Director General of WHO, WHO said, that we have to test, test, and test continuously. Only extension of testing and identifying the patients can let us, let us control this pandemic, epidemic in each country. <coughs> Coming back to the two other issues which I said I will talk about. This is the question is what are the medicines? If we look at the kind of disease it is, and of course I've asked Atul to get more knowledgeable people than me to discuss these issues later. So I'm not going to do it in great detail, I'm just giving a very rough and small overview of this, that in this particular phase of the epidemic globally, what we have to do is look at what existing medicine is there and how we can repurpose it, how we can see whether it can be used for COVID-19 cases also. So initially we tried with antiretrovirals, they may work in the very first phase of the disease, but once it goes to the lung, 
particularly the lower lung and becomes pneumonia. It's an inflammation of the lung and the body's immune system responding to the inf in infection of the lung that really creates a problem. The inflammation of the lung is a signal for the body to respond and the way it responds only makes the problem for most people worse. Now this particular phase in which this uh, COVID-19 really creates respiratory distress of different kinds. That period, the antiretrovirals really have no role. So anti-inflammatory medicines, and there is this uh, medicine which was developed against Ebola, which thought of Ebola was controlled, and therefore it really, really had no market. This is a Gilead medicine, which is now being repurposed for, uh, uh, for COVID-19. Let's see how that works. That's now being used in various places. And of course, what is now widely known, the chloroquine, hydrochloroquine, which is an anti-inflammatory, not because of the anti-malarial property, because of its anti-malarial property seems also to be working. So at the moment, the anti-malarial combined, the hydrochloroquine combined with azithromycin, a particular antibiotic which seems to also work well in lung infections. These are the two medicines which are being talked about. They are much easier to produce than the antiretrovirals. The antiretrovirals do not seem to have worked very, worked very well. And particularly because once it gets into your lung, then the antiretrovirals role is relatively limited. So this is where we are on the medicine front. Yes, we are more hopeful about the medicines developing quickly then about vaccines because vaccines as the who has said repeatedly almost all knowledgeable people are saying that we were not going to get a vaccine for the next 12 to 18 months why is the 12 to 18 months being said because vaccines have to go through a number of trials there are at least three stage of human trials they have to go through and the third stage needs extensive human trials to really make out whether it is working or not working. The first two are more for safety, understanding the dosage, etc. So these three levels of trials are not going to take place very quickly. They are going to take their time. What we can think about is if people are in the front line of the fight against the coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2, if that is the stage people are in, which is your medical professions, your health workers, the hospital staff, maybe, maybe, then we can try and bring at least a stage three trials. Also involve the hospital staff into the stage three trials and therefore provide at least some modicum of protection to them. So that is one possible hope that we have. But even then, we are looking at something like nine months away before even that can be done. But for the general population, we are very unlikely that we are going to see a vaccine in the next 12 months or so. And this is still, would still make it the fastest vaccine that has been ever been developed, the fastest vaccine that has been ever put into human trials, it still would not be, uh, it still would not be able to, we'd still not be able to do it before 12 months. So more or less, I have, I think, covered all I had said I will cover. I'm not dealing with the two other aspects of the COVID-19, which at some point somebody else can address, or I can come back to it later, which is what does it mean for the public health system and the medical system? You must understand that under capitalism, what we have seen happen is that ill health has value in terms of money. Public health is public expenditure. It has much less value for the medical industry, the pharmaceutical industry, or the hospital industry. So what you have is a healthcare system which looks after private profits. And if it looks after private profit, it effectively means it wants ill health because that is what produces money. It is healthy people don't give any benefit to the ill health industry, which is what the pharmaceutical industry is and what the hosp private hospital industry is. And that's why the public health has been continuously, uh, shall we say, disregarded 
in large parts of the world, which has been particularly the United States, which believes that private health care or insurance based health care is the way to go, which is what India is also doing currently. So this privatization of health care removes public health away from the people and makes the entire health industry an ill health industry because that's what produces profits. And because infectious diseases appear to be a problem of the poorer countries, the advanced, quote unquote, advanced countries did not have much of an interest in the diseases of the poor. So therefore, they went into a whole bunch of other medicines, including cancer, where they could charge very high amounts of money and which were really the, uh, therefore, uh, take, create much, much greater pressure on the insurance system as well. But this are really the focus of the drug industry or the pharmaceutical industry. And that's why we did not see, for instance, drugs against, say, infections which are still prevalent, tuberculosis. It's a disease of the poor, disease of the third world. Therefore, tuberculosis is not an active area of research by the pharmaceutical companies. Uh, malaria was an active area of research when the United States was in Vietnam and their soldiers required protection against malaria. So if you see all of this, what are the endemic diseases of the South, global South, malaria, dengue, tuberculosis, those the public health expenditures have actually shrunk. And only after Ebola and SARS, there has been certain vaccine initiatives which have been taken by private developers, governments, WHO, but by foundations. All of this is to sub supplement what was thought to be a problem really of the global south. It was not a problem of the global north. Unfortunately, the viruses have shown that they, they are capable of quote unquote striking back. And therefore, we are squarely back in a system where we have to put public health also at the center of our health policy, which is what most countries thought they should do, and which is what they are slowly moving away from. And even WHO, which is supposed to be a public body, is now funded by Bill and Melinda Gates and various foundations. The budget from the government uh, kitties of most governments in the world have shrunk, forcing WHO also to seek what is called public-private partnership. I think we need to look at this whole system, the health system that has been developing in the world. This is the biggest crisis we have had since long. Don't forget the last pandemic, global pandemic was 1918. What is called the Spanish flu. If we don't go by geographical origins, then of course, it is the 1918 flu, flu pandemic. Of course, it also started in Kansas, really. It didn't start, start in Spain. Leaving all of this out, that this is, a, this is 100 years. After 100 years, we have a pandemic again. And it is also going to test not only our public health medical system, but also test our democracies and our governments in different ways. I think Chinese bought us time to show how things could be done. Unfortunately, countries in Europe, the United States and India do not seem to have learned the lesson well enough and did not prepare in spite of the warnings it had. I think I have spoken more than the 25, 30 minutes uh, Atul had allotted to me. So I'm going to stop here. OK, thank you so much, uh, Prabhi. Uh, there are a lot of questions now, uh, which I'll uh, point out to you and maybe you can reply. I think you can take uh, one question at a time and uh, answer that. So we have a question from uh, S. Krishna Swami. Uh, his question is, what is the ratio of number of cases tested to number of cases that came positive in different countries, including India? Huh, that's a very difficult question to answer without looking at much larger uh, numbers, which I have to say I have not done. But if we take, for instance, what we are seeing in the United States right now, it seems to be about 5%. But they're testing very, very large numbers as of date. If we take India, our figures seem to show something like 30%. 
which would seem to show that we are testing really patients who are much more likely to be infected and therefore our test results results are that large one in three is testing positive i would say even the us as you know has been lagging behind on testing but if you take for instance what the koreans are seeing the koreans figures are again much lower than 1% they are testing much larger numbers than uh, what they are getting at the moment of course korean figures are much much lower i'm talking about when they were really ratcheting up their testing and they were show seeing a lot of infections i would say anything above 5% is extremely questionable so 1 is to 20 1 is to 30 what we should be seeing if you see what the chinese data i'm not going to say we can do that in the next 3 months in guangdong province alone they had tested at one point in 20 days 320000 people and they identified 402 persons as infected now those numbers i don't think they are going to reach even the more you know in a in a long in a long time but at the moment india needs to test at least 50000 to 60000 a day at the number of infections we are seeing and the number of deaths we are seeing none number of deaths are also an underestimate because i think more people are dying and not being understood that they have died from covid 19 thank you pravi so there is another question from pallavi uh, she has asked you given the condition of public health in india will the hospitals not quickly turn into hotbeds as in italy how can this be handled with selective screening and biases can one expect that there would be any effective help accessible to the poor well at the moment the way we are going i do not think this uh, the hospital system will be able to stand up to the overwhelming numbers we might start seeing so i think the issue that the poor are going to get access to health itself is uh, completely uh, wrong i don't think that the bulk of the population who are going to be infected are going to be able to reach hospitals so why i am saying this is because i have a colleague who was in news click about a year and a half back she is now right now in new york that's supposed to be better off than we are certainly their hospital systems is much stronger than india is and even though they don't have a public health system they have a privatized highly privatized health system she was told after she was tested positive for covid 19 she had all the symptoms so she, the, she was not tested she has yet to be tested because she is only 32 or so and though they have identified that she is a covid 19 case the only help they have given her is told her please go to the nearest drug store buy an inhaler for yourself and take the inhaler okay apart from that an aspirin or paracetamol is no, no other medicine which she has been able to access so even in new york uh, which is at the moment i think has more patients than china has the amount of support that the state is able to give or the hospital system is able to give is minimal so i don't think that it's only going to be a question of poor i think we are going to see a collapse of the hospital system if we reach that stage and i am afraid that we are going to reach that stage it's only a question of one month two months or three months if you prepare with proper protective gear if we prepare that we have this two months time for example if we do then can we equip more temporary makeshift hospitals can we put the less infected say in the indoor stadium we have in talkatora make that into an indoor hospital can we set up makeshift hospitals or quarantine facilities in a number of the hostels which are now lying idle those are the kind of selections that we will have to do and the question is how do we attend to these people because even if you have a makeshift makeshift hospital you require nursing staff you require food to be served you require the hospital to be kept clean and of course you need doctors so protective gear for them is the crucial issue and of course are we able to provide in the hospitals then resp oxygen equip oxygen for the people ventilators respirators of different kinds those are the key questions that we are going to face i have no 
really hope that our hospitals will do better. But at least our doctors can be equipped in the next two weeks, three weeks. If President Trump could rig up Prime Minister President Xi and ask for help, and they got airlifted, 22 aircrafts were filled with equipment and taken to the United States. Modi can also certainly rig up Xi and ask for help because China is coming back in industrial terms. Its ability to produce masks, produce protective gear has just been ramped up and they were the industrial, really the industrial center of the world and they certainly can help if at the state to state level we ask them. But as you know, we don't seem to be asking China for test kits either. So these are some of the questions that we have. Why we are not doing it? What prevents us from doing? I have no idea. So uh, there is another question from Samantha. Her question is the high incubation time for COVID-17. Do you find any correlation with the increase in the spread of disease? Well, what happens is because it incubates for about, could incubate as much as 10 to 14 days, some cases even longer. What happens, you are for a large period of the time, you are asymptomatic. You really don't have symptoms. And then you are still what is called shedding the virus. When you're shedding the virus, though you're not shedding as much virus as you are when you're symptomatic, then you are infecting others. And that is one of the reasons that the infections do take place among people who are not apparently infected, but really are. So that is also something that the Chinese have seen in Wuhan. And what they did is when they now do what I call the case fatality ratio, they are saying the number of people who are asymptomatic, therefore were not tested, is 60 to 80 percent of the total population, I mean, if, let's put it this way. If the number of people have been in Wuhan seem to be something like 64,000 who are infected, probably the actual number was at least two times larger. So if that is so, then of course, there is a much larger spread of the COVID-19 because of asymptomatic people. That is one. Second is what is the proof that is so? So we have now what are called serological tests, blood tests, where you can see people have antibodies or not. If they have antibodies, that means they were infected at one point or other. And those are the ones which will really tell us the extent of the epidemic that took place and how many were really identified. I think once the serological, epidemiological studies are done in Wuhan, we'll get much better answers on that count. But it does seem that it is possible the numbers of Wuhan or the Chinese themselves have said 60% were not identified. The number is probably going to be at the end higher once they do the serological tests. Okay. So Avinav, Avinav Surya has asked you a question that given the lack of vaccinations, uh, I think so it's still not there, but still numbers of cases must reach its natural peak everywhere. But we don't see that with China. What happened there? Well, very clearly, what happened in China is that they were able to control the epidemic. Now, this is not the first epidemic people have controlled without vaccine. For instance, the SARS, what is now called the SARS-CoV-1, SARS-CoV, was also controlled. And it was controlled by human action. So it is the, if the numbers are small and the infection rate is not so high, then it is possible to control the infection. When the infection rate is high, then of course you need to do what China did, which is lockdown and centralized quarantine. These are the two measures they took in Hubei. But if you look at the rest of China, they didn't really do what they did in Wuhan or they did in certain parts of Hubei. The other parts had basically physical distancing. They allowed people to go to the supermarket People were there going out and coming back. They all wore masks. They all washed their hands. This allowed them in three to four weeks in different parts of China to be able to control the disease and bring down the infections. Don't forget what is called the spring festival in uh, China, which is really the new year, like our Christmas, Christmas, Diwali uh, year. 
So those, that festival, a huge number of people left Wuhan and they infected other parts of China. So in spite of the fact that they did not do the lockdown they did in Wuhan, they were able to control the virus, the infections in China. And that shows that yes, it is possible if people cooperate and if the government has a plan, then it is possible to do this. But it needs social acceptance. It cannot be done by the people giving its government giving its diktat to the people. So China, as again, I'm quoting Bruce Aylward, who is the WHO uh, person, who was a head, co-head of the team that WHO and China sat up, set up. So he said that it was all in government and all in people's effort in China, which actually stopped the disease. So that is what you have to do. And this is not a question of South Korea versus China. Let's be very clear. South Korea did do a lot of the measures China did, but they relatively had a much smaller epidemic, also confined to a particular group in which this epidemic had really started appearing in large numbers, which is the particular Christian uh, sect, which was very secretive and didn't even make public its members and so on. So that was why they had an epidemic and they could control it because it was largely confined or initially confined to two places where the sect had certain members. So that had, there's a different case that South Korea was facing. But Wuhan, it had really spread. Wuhan is not a small place, it's 11 million population. And the Hubei's population is also not small. It's 60 million, in the same size as Italy, in fact, a little more. So these are in fact bigger than actually South Korea. If you take Wuhan, the Hubei province, where we had the major uh, disease issue, that was really a bigger population than South Korea, and the numbers were much higher when they recognized that they had a problem on their hands. So I do not think we should really think on those lines. The real issue is that at the level of implementation, what China made possible was the cooperation of the peoples, the people's committees, the way they decentralized even food distribution, the way the government and the people work together, that's the way they could control it. Unfortunately, those kind of structures are weak in most countries. And therefore, their ability to replicate what China did or even what South Korea did may be much more difficult. So uh, Animesh ask you another question. Is that any idea whether the said virus mutated during the visit to European Union or USA and changed its character? Well, the argument is that it doesn't seem to change very rapidly. Again, that I'm not going to claim that I'm a, a micro, microbiologist, so my uh, answers are going to be extremely simplistic, but it seems to mutate at the rate of roughly three mutations per month, the 30 days, that seems to be the rate of mutation. Again, these are figures I'm pulling out from different research publications. I don't know how much sanctity it has. So at the moment, you, we would think that it would mutate as it goes from, as it spreads over time. So time is the issue here, not so much geography, geography or geographic isolation. So of course you'd get different strains. Are you seeing different strains having different effects on people? At the moment, it doesn't seem so. It would be a slow mutating virus, and it doesn't seem to have mutated in any significant way in the way it's spreading. So I don't think there are any significant differences between, at the moment, China, Italy, or the United States in terms of the virus. I would not treat Italy as a separate case. I would treat essentially the core European Union countries, France, Germany, Italy and smaller countries like Belgium, uh, Netherlands, Switzerland as part of the same. So those countries do not add up to very large numbers if you take, for instance, India, China, or even the United States. If you take those countries, then I think they're roughly seeing very similar patterns to what we saw in Wuhan earlier and what we're seeing now in the United States right, right, right now. So the question really is, is there a fast mutating virus? The answer seems to be no. The answer is, is it behaving very differently in different countries, different continents? I don't think so. 
Pawan has asked you that has India started manufacturing importing enough PPEs? Enough PPEs, PPE. the protective gear, I think. Ah, we do seem to make a certain number of them. We seem to make masks. We also seem to make um, uh, basically uh, goggles and gloves for sure. We also make uh, body uh, suits. The question is, do we make it at the scale at which we require? The answer is no. So that is the key problem we are going to have. How quickly can we ratchet up? How quickly can you scale up production? Unfortunately, the lockdown is also going to affect the way we can, the speed at which we can rack up or ratchet up the production. It depends how effective a supply chain is going to be under such conditions. Because if trucks cannot transport goods and people will not know what goes into a mask, what goes into a uh, goggles, what goes into other protective gears, it's going to be very difficult to, for uh, people to start doing the manufacture. Nobody manufactures everything from scratch. So that's a supply chain issue, which I do not know at the moment how seriously the government is, has been able to maintain the essential supply chain for protection, protective equipment. I would say at the moment we should not hesitate, but import at least for the next one, two months and have create what is called strategic reserve of protective gear. If we don't have that, when will we, when we require it, we just will not have the time to do it. So we'll take the last two questions. Uh, so Burhan from Bangladesh asks you that it is evident that China and South Korea use different approach to tackle this deadly virus. What should be the right balance or combination for the countries of South Asia, according to you? Well, I don't think we should at the moment think of South Asia as having a common problem. Even the countryside in India, the rural areas would have a different level of problem than the urban areas would. We are start, starting to see major clusters develop in Delhi, Mumbai, maybe in other places too. So we will have to do a selective process. But at the same time, let's not think of what South Korea and China as two alternate models. The basic issue is both tested widely, the both separated those who are infected from those who are not, and the both used quarantine. The extent of the lockdown differed in the places. Of course, South Korea, it was partial lockdown. In China, it was a full lockdown in Hubei province. Other places, it was still a partial lockdown. So I would say that these are the measures that we will have to take in different mixes in different places, both in Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan, the South Asian countries, and also Nepal. I think we are going to see major challenges because essentially the way the state has to work and the way people have to work with it, that basic rapport or that basic coordination, if it is not there, it's going to be very, very difficult. I don't think we can control the epidemic by diktats from a central government or even by state governments. So I think that's the key crisis that we're going to see soon that yes having large policies of lockdowns may work to postpone the date to postpone the date when the epidemic will really extend but unfortunately it is not a question of if it will extend but only a question of when and that when when it comes we have to be prepared to be able to do all the measures that wuhan did however selective it might be, however partial it might be, however focused on certain parts of it it might be, the measures are not going to change. Separate the people, those infected from those who are not infected, take them to hospital, those who require really intensive care, and take other people who are infected to hospitals where you can at least separate them from other people and also provide them with medical care and see who are serious and needs really to be taken to major hospitals. This is the way you will avoid deaths. Otherwise, you have a laissez-faire situation, which will introduce periodic lockdowns, 
more and which will be more and more ineffective as we progress down the disease. So I think this time it may postpone by maybe four to six weeks, the onset of the epidemic. It's already there. The doubling rate may slow down for at least another four to six weeks. But when it does hit, repeated lockdowns are not going to have the same effect. So I think we have to move to what the Chinese have called the centralized quarantine and the centralized makeshift hospitals where you separate those who are infected from the rest. Heartless as it might sound, this is the, probably the way large countries with dense population will have to do. So Luca has asked you a question that recently a wave of nationalist sentiment rapidly grew in China, given that people believe the government did a good job. Do you think it will happen to India if the same happened to India? Well, it will depend on how well the Indian government does its job. At the moment, it has botched the first three jobs it had, which is to prepare for the lockdown. It does appear that the preparation for the lockdown was lacking. The poor sections did not see food and they were forced virtually into a situation where they felt they had to go back home. And if everybody or the large section of the Indian population still considers village as their home, even if they stay in the urban areas for a part of the major part of their lives. So that is one failure the government had. The second failure, and it had time, it had time post uh, January when the Wuhan, uh, Wuhan lockdown was there, the extent of the disease was known. From that time onwards, the, we had time and today we are in 1st April, yet our testing system has not been brought up to a level level where we can test at least five to ten thousand people in every state in the country at least five thousand we are nowhere near it so the second failure the third failure is protective equipment we knew if this disease is there we knew how infectious it was we did it protective equipment for the hospitals i'm not talking for the normal people yes okay the mask protect others from you if you are infectious. It doesn't protect the person who is actually infected, who is not infected, and who therefore is to breathe in your uh, virus, as it were. But the hospital staff, we don't seem to be prepared even for that. So we also had notice from what, what happened to Italy, which is four weeks back. We are now seeing what's happening in the United States. So we had, we had prior notice. We have been having at least eight weeks lead time. That's what China did give everybody. So we don't see, we don't seem to have reacted like that. We'll have to give this government one credit. At least they understood, unlike Bolsonaro and initially Trump, that this disease does threaten India. And therefore, they at least thought about the lockdown. Even if they bossed it up, at least they knew that they had to do something. Bolsonaro doesn't seem even today to believe that they have to do something. So I think India's record, given its three failures as I've identified, and its lockdown, uh, it's, it sort of hangs in the balance whether we will get a nationalist pride or at the end of it we'll get such erosion of authority by the state, of the, by, by the state I mean the government, governments in this case, that we will have a real crisis on our hands, which would be a political crisis. Because if the state does not have authority, then controlling the epidemic becomes even more difficult. Thank you so much, Praveen. Uh, I know there are a lot of other questions, very good questions, but I think we'll be uh, meeting again and again, uh, at least for this week, the, the coming week. Uh, so I would request everyone to now allow Praveen to leave and we can take up, because there are questions which we can take up uh, tomorrow with the, the other speaker will be coming. So tomorrow, uh, Satyajit, Dr. Satyajit Rath from Pune, uh, he'll be uh, the one who is going to uh, give a talk and he'll be looking at the questions of uh, how this disease came into being and what are the stereotypes attached to China. And uh, so this is what we'll be talking tomorrow. So thank you so much, Praveer, once again, uh, for uh, being part of this. And uh, hopefully we'll get uh, a lot of other uh, chances to get you here and talk about more, uh, talk about it more. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank everybody.